Hi, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Nick Howell, a.k.a. the Data Center Dude. Uh, I'm the global field CTO at NetApp for our cloud data services. And one of the people that I have looked up to and have been following for the last couple of years on this journey, uh, mostly throughout Azure NetApp Files. And Kirk, I'm going to let you introduce yourself here because uh, you, have, you wear so many hats. But Kirk Ryan, based out of the UK, has been on the forefront of what's going on in Azure, Azure NetApp Files, and our integrations with SAP HANA for for a long time now. So Kirk, uh, do me a favor, let everybody know who you are and what you're up to and why you're here. Thanks, Nick, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. So my name's Kirk. I am the principal technologist for Azure NetApp Files. I'm based over here in EMEA, uh, UK. If you want to know exactly where, Liverpool. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been on the journey since, as I say, day one with, uh, with the work we've been doing around helping customers build SAP in Azure. So whether that's building new projects or uh, moving existing ones into the cloud and as in the whole stack. So it's been interesting. Uh, lessons learned, lots sure. of success. And um, yeah, lo long may it continue, really. It's, it's been a very busy place to be. Yeah. Um, so, yep. It, absolutely a uh, pleasure to be on this. So how would you how would you describe to somebody in 30 seconds or give them the elevator pitch of what exactly is Azure NetApp Files? So Azure NetApp Files, uh, the first thing I would say is just because it has the word NetApp in there, you're not expected to know any NetApp whatsoever. Yeah. Probably the most confusing thing about it is the name. It's actually a Microsoft service. It's the same as buying a, a premium disk or an ultra disk. It's not a marketplace offering. It is extremely high performance, low latency, um, with, with a lot of reliability built in shared file platform that Microsoft have brought to market. We are the OEM. We helped Microsoft build it, hence why our name's in it. And uh, you would have seen some really interesting things in the news around you know, the, the history that NetApp has with SAP stuff uh, in, in the background and our history of building rather large multi-petabyte estates of it. Oh, yeah. so. So that's why we're doing is uh, helping people build it out in Asia. Yeah, and the biggest takeaway for me that I've watched happen is that one of the big obstacles for tier one applications and large workloads and things like that in the cloud in general, even on prem, is usually storage performance and latency. There's usually some very large multi tier database, back end infrastructure that nobody except the DBAs and the infrastructure folks see. Uh, but it's usually the number one cause of performance issues for the front end that everybody sees. So how, how have we solved all of that stuff for the cloud? The reason I wanted you to introduce Azure NetApp Files really is because we have fixed a key problem, and that's storage performance. And that, to me, is what has enabled SAP. So can you talk about that journey a little bit? Sure. So, I mean, if you look right at the start of the journey, before even Azure NetApp Files was on the scene, if you were going to go and build an SAP environment or landscape in Azure, you'd be expected to build a lot of it as IaaS. So that means, you know, even for just shared files, the, the low performance or the backup or whatever it may be, you were building them on your own NFS clusters. You had to build your own file services because Azure didn't have an uh, NFS service that you could just say, give me an NFS volume. Yeah. And that's where the partnership really came from is, okay, look, NFS is is fundamental to workloads such as SAP, SAP HANA, as, as well as pretty much anything that operates in Linux or Unix. So um, it was a, a big gaping hole to have in their portfolio, especially when you looked at the competitive landscape. And, you know, SAP uh, and Azure wanted to make, or Microsoft wanted to make Azure, you know, one of the go-to places to go and do uh, SAP, SAP HANA. Um, so... They, they, that, that partnership really came from saying, well, who's out there that does NFS at this scale? Ooh. Who is it that understands, you know, the, re <laughs> the, the reliability, the, the scaling, right. um, you know, so that, that was really where it all came from. And um, yeah, we were, we were glad that we got ahead of that curve and you know, we're almost, what, two years into this now. So it's... Uh, been going very it's well. It's not that we're just ahead of the curve. I think that's important to call it. There's no, there's nobody else doing what we're doing in the in the public cloud well, right now. It, it's hard. Like I love a good, healthy competition more than anybody. I think, but there's there's not a lot out there outside of the services that the native cloud providers themselves are providing. 
So oh, that's we're right. kind of we're kind of running we're kind of running this as we go. It's not like there's there's some charter to compete against an HP or a Dell EMC or a Pure or anybody else that's doing this kind of like who's delivering PaaS storage offerings directly off of their own gear in not just one but all three major public cloud providers. Anybody? Nobody. Us. That's it. <laughs> Like maybe we'll get vSAN and with VMC and things like that at some point in the future. That could be interesting, but I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, at this point, if you want, look, there's also some gaps here. This isn't just all all about Azure. Uh, Google Cloud. Did you know before a few recently you could not do SMB in Google Cloud? If you wanted to do anything other than NFS, you had to kind of roll your own, build it, ex uh, export it out, do all that, right? If you wanted to run NFS in Azure, you had to roll your own. Now you have a turnkey PaaS offering that will do both NFS and SMB across all three cloud providers. Give it a name, give it a capacity, give it a service level. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, brilliant. And, you know, that, that's probably the majority of the conversations, I'd say. Almost every customer I've spoken to over the last 18 months have come from that place. Yeah. They they're either had already built it and it was an area they wanted to improve, um, or they'd identified it and it was holding up the project. It, it was a blocker. So, sure. yeah, the, you know, being a, it's, it's quite nice to work for a company that we can turn around and say, well, we're the, the only vendor that, that is... Uh, certified not just by SAP, but but also by the hyperscalers themselves. There's the three players in exactly. this across across the two biggest clouds for SAP Hana, right? So yeah, it's uh, it's certainly great to to be in that space. And um, what are some of the complicated I, things involved directly with SAP? Since we have a mostly SAP sort of audience here, what are some of the things that were tricky in the cloud specifically? Uh, we, we did announce the SAP HANA certification last fall. I'm, I'm curious if you have any memories of going through that process uh, and, and things that stood out to you that you didn't think were going to be possible in the cloud or any good stories to tell there. So, yeah, I mean, we, we always had a confidence that from a, a storage perspective, obviously, we've done this on-prem for a long right. time. So we, we knew the technology was well proven. Um, what, what was new was then actually, how do you take something that we've done and customers have skilled up in what we've done and how to do it and basically turn it into something native? So you're talking like native APIs, native billing. It's not coming from a marketplace. It's it's coming straight off your enterprise agreement. It's supported by Microsoft in that instance, that sort of stuff. It was actually the work, the, the, the most engineering work went into integration right and that was like one of the the three three key points that was mentioned in in that keynote was you know the integration i straight away just thought actually that's exactly where the crux of our engineering went was in in that sort of uh that 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 key area so i mean when, when we started on the certification process and everything i suppose it was actually saying well actually we know the storage can do it can the network handle how much io we're going to throw there you in go. it that's where I was sort of looking at, you know, we, we may need to change the way to do things in networking here. So, um, yeah, but luckily everything went through. We, we've got you know very scalable solution there and lots of uh, stuff that, you know, Chad and Bernd and all, all the other uh, experts in performance and uh, much more bigger experts in SAP uh, than me that, that have written and shown a lot of this stuff in action. So it, it, it's great to, to see what the art of the possible is but more importantly i suppose it's great to see that actually you know i look at my customer base how many people there are sap are you know the the, the majority yeah. are sap so yeah I, mean, I, I don't know of any of the fortune 1000 that aren't using it I, I, I struggle to find anybody that's not using some element of sap software stack some or all i'll, I'll say it that way there, there's it's it seems so tied into the modern day-to-day -day business world that you're going to find it in some way shape or form across just about every enterprise out there there's going to be somebody that's using the ERP there's going to be somebody that's using uh, the the a lot of the other pieces there's different varying levels of who's going to do it whether you're in manufacturing or healthcare or finance or any everybody's using SAP in 2020. 
So I think it's that big of a deal that we uh, make sure and prioritize performance. Because if you've ever used any sort of database-driven multi-tier application before, you know that storage performance is paramount, right? There are certainly things in the database architectures, but if you have terrible storage latency and terrible storage performance, it affects everything else all the way up stack. So I'm, I love the fact that we have proven that we can go in and get hundreds of thousands of IOPS at sub millisecond latency, gigabytes per second kind of throughput in Azure NetFile natively. Just without, I, I never have to touch a knob. I never have to touch a storage array. It blows my mind that that's even possible, but it's real. Uh, 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 and to do it without knowing anything about storage, yeah. I mean, you only need to know two things, right? It's how much space do you need and how fast do you want to go? If you can answer those two questions, an SAP give you a document that tells you how fast you've got to yeah. go and what your sizing should right. really be, that then you just click go. You fill in those two and you hit go and, and off you go. But I suppose what where, where everyone starts is, is very different from your journey of where you went. You know, and, and where I've seen with customers, they all start from the, a very similar starting point. Um, but then their, their, their needs, as they learn them and as the systems go live and everything else, and we, we saw it, you know, case in point with the stream today, right, is they probably said we're going to have this many viewers and then this many turned up. Uh, uh, and, you know, that, that's what we saw the effects of right there. And it's no different in database, right? You build it and the reality is you don't really know 100% what's going to happen when it gets out in the wild sort of thing. True. So, you know, uh, having a, as an architect, I always think, well, where's the ceiling? Because if I'm going to put it in this place and, I, and it's taking me some time to get there, how much breathing space does that give me before I got to basically do this thing again? True. Um, so, yeah, with 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 ANF in, in Azure, you know, that, that's that been great for me building solutions over the last 18 months because I've been the most relaxed I've ever been as an architect in many years. Like you used to like put the solutions in and you'd go, oh, there's only 20% room there. So they, they've they've said they want 5% growth a year or whatever it may be. Uh, uh, and you think, okay, well, they got their three years. That's what they asked for. But in the cloud, it's like, well, like you said, you know, a project can go live much faster than ever before. In fact, our POCs, generally we start a POC within a week. Um, we will say, right, let's not do this on a PowerPoint. Let's go and set the environment up and we'll go do it. And then you can't, you got nowhere to go. There's no, well, you signed off on this. It's well, actually, we're here. How, how can we change stuff dynamically? And more importantly as well, and something that's really unique about what we're doing here is there's a traditional way you size storage, which was always hey, uh, we need this much, this is this is our peak, and we're going to size for like this line here so that we can always deal with the peak. Yeah. Uh, and what's changed is, well, actually in the cloud, and it's widely understood for, for compute, is, well, when there's no demand, I don't want to pay for the gap between the baseline and this because that's my cost saving. That's why I'm going to the cloud in the first place, right? Uh, and it's widely understood with compute. But with storage, if you've ever tried pulling disks out your array, and I'm not sure where your array is in the picture, if it's like somewhere in the background or something, but try well, pull a disk out there. and then try pull another one. <laughs> Mine, mine's there. If I try pull three disks out because I'm not using them, I, I know what's going to happen, right? right? So uh, with, with, with the solutions that we've got and built, <laughs> yeah, it's not healthy. But you can just do it. You can say, well, actually, you pay for performance in the cloud. That, anyone can buy it, sell, sell a gigabyte. Sure. A gigabyte's easy. You pay for performance. And if you can scale that performance, that's where you make your cost savings. So so that's been the cool bit for us is also saying that that was a learning adventure for us. We knew we could do it. We just didn't know what those would be. Sure. Um, and we didn't know how to get them. It was like, well, hmm, how, how do you actually figure out when you need and how you need it and stuff? So th there's been a journey. Yeah, this is definitely one of those where like I came before like pre-2010 getting into virtualization. I was I was a, an admin, you know, engineer, right? And at the end of the day, my, it was my job to make sure everything stayed up and running and that everybody could get to their email and get to the applications and all of that. So, yeah, performance was always a big deal. Um, and just as availability was a big deal. What is the current state of things uh, with it, when it comes to Azure NetApp files with regards to HA, cross-region, things like that? And, and how does that affect things like... SAP implementations. I, I did put a link in the chat for everybody with to 
uh, TR, what was it, 4746, which is our Azure implementation guide, basically, our TR for using Azure NetApp files to run SAP in Azure. So definitely have a look if you want to see what our some of our recommendations and our best practices and things like that are. But yeah, Kirk, talk to me about scaling. Talk to me about cross-region uh, availability zones, anything that you can, because I think there's been this... There's been this experience that we can only operate in one one node, one facet, and that kills the idea of any kind of scaling. So, yeah, it's an important thing to know, right? So we were proud to announce oh, a while back that we're actually operating at four nines out of a single uh, zone. So historically, you've always had to go to a minimum of two zones to get four nines, right? You don't need to do that with ANF. The storage subsystem is already delivering four yeah. nines. So you've got your SLA there, and you can build that out as part of a composite solution to get four nines all the way through your stack, because it's a lot more than just the data. But from the data perspective, four nines. So that's pretty cool. The next thing, though, and uh, you know, it's been my whole day today, has, has literally just been talking to some of the, these, uh, these companies that are heavily use an SAP um, and uh, for a global stra uh, level. And it's been like, well, cross-region replication. What's new? How does that help us? How does it do it? And for those that have used any of our stuff before, they're, they're very familiar with it. They know it for a different name. Uh, some of you will know it for its brand name and stuff. But when we're talking about in, in Asia, obviously, we don't use that name because you don't ever touch or are expected to know anything about NetApp. All you need is cross-region replication. And it's as simple as if you've got a primary volume in, let's say, EU West, and you want proper regional DR, that you can control, then you go and set a secondary you know, protection volume in EU North and you tell it. You go and replicate every 10 minutes or once an hour or once a day or however often you want to go and do it. And there's no networking for you to set up. It uses the Azure Backbone. It, it, it's, it's extremely fast. It's the fastest replication you can get between the two sites. Yep. From a data perspective, you're not limited by VM hosts or NICs or anything like that. Uh, it's all just done for you, as in proper PaaS. So once you've set up your source, you set up the destination, and you just cross-region replication off you go. Now, it is only in peered regions, right? So you've got EU West, EU North. You've got the UK regions coming online. Uh, I think that's this week, which is pretty cool. Um, you've got US regions that appear to one another. We've been had that since December. Uh, some early access customers over there heavily using that. So uh, question yeah, in the, I question in the chat problem. said that's for geo replication from the Mesa. I, I want to like reiterate what you just said. This is for uh, partners, regional partner data centers. Yeah. So as long yeah, as you're going right. between so those, yes, replication. you're going over the backbone. You're you're, you know, you're you're getting super crazy fast speeds, and it's not at, at, oh, any, yeah. at basically no cost to you. So. That's it. I mean, if you look at the chart of who's got the fastest speed, you probably got someone like Microsoft, and you got Nick for his streams, and then I'm probably in the third place somewhere there, right? So <laughs> the, 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 you're using the Azure backbone uh, entirely. So you don't even need to do like global VNet peering. Right. It doesn't use any of the networking your side, which means, well, that's one less thing for me to manage or set up or orchestrate. I don't need to template it with my Terraform or anything like that. It's just. As I'm provisioning the volume, I can tell it there is go provision the partner, uh, authenticate the two. So it's always uh, it's secure, uh, and it's delivered by the platform. So uh, you know if if I would have to pay for an application to go and do that for me, maybe there's an additional replication license or something. If it suits my needs, then I can just use the storage instead and replace that license entirely. So when you're setting that up, is it done at volume creation at the sort of inception, or is that something I can add to? Uh, an existing volume down the road. Yeah, so your primary volume will have to exist because you need to point it at the primary volume uh, to start with. So when you're setting up your secondary volume, uh, basically you, you tell it where the source is as part of that provisioning. Um, then what happens is basically you have the handshake. So you know there's a protection mechanism in there that an admin can't just go in and say, I'm going to take all the data from that subscription over there. Um, it, it, it basically says, okay, well, somebody with permission to, to the source will need to go and authorize that relationship. So it's an appending state, effectively. Once you've authorized it, that's it. It, it, it goes to your, the schedule that you put in. So if you put every 10 minutes, it may be, a, uh, it is pretty much so far from what I've seen, like 20 past, half past, 22. So it is pretty much set up like that and, and off you go. So, um, it, it, you know, 
I, I did the demos and um you know the, the feedback i got today for example show, showing this uh, one organization they were we, we we had an hour slot we we got to the 17th minute he goes so so it's that easy like, yeah what do you want to speak about with the rest of the time right so <laughs> so you had an hour time a lot and you got through it in 17 minutes yeah Yep. Uh, question in the chat from the Misa again. Uh, thanks for asking these, by the way. Guys, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. We'll, Kirk and I will be happy to answer them here. Uh, you're sharing the bandwidth with, with the rest of Azure when you're doing that. It's not dedicated speed for the customer. Is that correct? So it's the Azure backbone, right? So everyone's sharing something somewhere, right? Uh, when, when it com comes to Azure, unless you're paying for like dedicated compute or anything, the the, the network itself, yeah, it, it is there. And obviously what you get is that your volumes basically dictate how fast you can go. So that's your read speeds, your write speeds, so bigger volumes, more throughput. So it's directly linked to that. Um, and the really cool thing is you don't need a third party uh, sort of software to go and monitor this. It's in the uh, the Azure monitor directly. So you can see like what's the lag time, all the usual stuff we check, uh, how much data am I transferring? What is really cool is if you're worried about bandwidth, just to know that it is using the same technologies we use on prem, right? So that means before we move your data, it's like you've got your one time sync, but that is post efficiencies and everything else that happens. Right. So that that is already very efficient data. It's compressed, it's compacted, it's due to everything under the covers and sent down the wire. So that means that you can get in that consistent synchronized state faster than ever, especially when compared to, for example, the way we do it today with uh, Cloud Sync. And that's not saying don't don't use cloud sync we've got a lot of customers using cloud sync and stuff but this is the next generation of, of taking that that protection to a new level yeah. now and over the uh, and over the azure go. backbone not over your own circuits that you've wired up exactly exactly and then when you take that and you say okay well I, let, now we're doing things at a block level it's a totally entirely different game you are then saying well it's change only delta between you know what could be every 10 minutes and you're giving the the database admins and everyone else the ability to actually turn around and say, well, I'm giving you the equivalent of a full restore um, at the cost of an incremental. And that's from a network cost, from a storage cost, from a, everything else. And it couldn't be more simpler than that. So, you know, Burnt Heath, for example, published the article on uh, on some of the, the websites we have outlining how this all works, how you can see it in the landscape manager, everything else there. Um, and it... You know, one of the DBAs I was talking to today actually turned around and said to me, so that means if we were doing hourlies, the maximum amount of logs I'd ever have to replay would be 59 minutes, 59 seconds, worst case. I said, yeah. Uh, why? What does that mean to you? He said, well, today, if I had to do a full restore, it could be 23 hours. You know, that's the difference between it taking 16, 18 hours to restore to get back to a, a, re, uh, a good state. Um, so using this, <laughs> you know, I'm talking... About taking it down to to maybe less than an hour for for a full restore on his estate. So I thought, well, okay, well that's your value right there. You you sold the product to yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's funny when you when they when you see the customers get it. And and the interesting thing to note here is like this is not like all new surprise stuff that NetApp has come out with. <clears throat> um, th this is stuff NetApp has been doing for decades. So the the reason it's easy for us to in a way, teach these cloud providers how to more efficiently do these things is because it's not stuff that they've ever done before or done well. And here we come as the godfathers of NAS and SAN at this point, frankly. Uh, we've figured out how to move data between nodes across with Metro Cluster, have highly available uh, working sets and all of that. So this isn't it comes across in a way a little bit arrogant sometimes that we know how to do this stuff, but it's because we've been doing it for so long. And I think people get into the cloud and they think that they have to use the native storage from the cloud providers in order for their thing to work in the cloud. But it's not true. They can use the stuff uh, from us. So, and Yeah, and it's exactly that, right? So we, we, we solved these problems quite a while back with SAP themselves, right? right? Who, who just went on the record to say, you know, SAP, NAP, long history, done a lot together. In fact, a lot of SAP runs on NetApp. Yeah. Right? So that's just been released on the record. So that's a really interesting sort of vote of confidence. The vendor of this equipment runs their stuff on NetApp. So if you're looking to go to the cloud and you saw the keynote, right? 
They're saying, you know, the, the cloud, they're looking to go into it. They want to make the application stack a bit more agile and everything else. And then you look at, okay, well, your data's got to sit somewhere. How are you going to protect it? How are you going to make sure it's reliable, it's available? Um, and then they talked about agility quite a bit. So I'm doing buzzword bingo now, am I? Uh, well, let's get back to technical <laughs> stuff. So the Misa, again, ask, thank you for the questions. Uh, wants to clarify, for a system using NetApp-mounted files for HANA and DB or log, uh, any value in using NetApp replication to get the data to the second zone or region instead of relying on HSR? How does NetApp work together with HSR? So let's clarify again. If you're doing regional replication, cross-regional replication, CRR, if you're doing that between your partner geo regional regions that is going over let's just say that's interconnected stamps of netapp gear between the two regions talking to each other over the netapp backbone is that fair to say kirk that's right you're yeah, not so going out over the, over the front the end or using any sort of other vpns or express routes or trying to do anything out of the front door you're it's being handled for you on the back end in a very in the most granular way possible in the way that NetApp has been doing it for a really really long time preserving all of the efficiencies uh, all of the best practices to make sure that all that's done also Greg is saying yeah. did you say you can configure a POC in less than a week uh, yeah we, we've had customers actually provision much faster that, like within a week we've gone from conversation to uh, small scale POC, functional testing, then testing pipelines around how they provision it, what they're going to use to to monitor it, where the alarms are. Um, and I'm not saying they go live after a week, but the POC certainly, from that standpoint, you know, we, we've either got a yes, no, um, <laughs> of yeah, this does exactly what they said. It's it's as performant as they said. It's as easy as they said. Um, and then yeah, uh, the the other thing is then we start looking at the other bit, use cases. So you got data and log, which you mentioned there for. Um, using the, the HANA system replication. And again, you know, that's not to say don't use HANA system replication. I, I'm certainly not saying that, you know, that, that's got a continuous sort of uh, replication that's available. And that's something that cross-region won't do. Cross-region is asynchronous. Yeah. Okay, so it's really good for things like, um, you know, your, your shared binaries, uh, maybe your backups, other Redo pieces there. And, and then things like that. Re exactly, yeah. that sort of stuff. That, And then... Um, you, you do have the, the pieces on, on, on top of that where you then might have sort of different requirements between if your SAP is built on Windows, for example, then you've got SMB out the same service with the same metrics and everything else and monitoring that. And then you can protect it in the same way as well. So they're, they're, they're really sort of a lot of where we see. Yeah, I think the differentiator is um, coming down to between to like DR versus application level. I mean, if we generalize things a little bit more, there's DR, there's keeping your data safe just in case and then there's a sort of application level availability conversation you have to have where you have a failover a live failover in case something if everything goes to all of a sudden your users are redirected with a load balance an elastic load balancer over to this other compute instance that's running that also has a synchronous copy uh, to me those are two different conversation and, and it's really depends i would do both depending on your needs there's going to be reasons for both yeah, uh, and one doesn't preclude you from doing the other, right? Because you think about it, if you've got a consistent application restore point, and what that's absolutely what um, ANF can go and deliver for you, if you're replicating bad data or something, uh, you've got that point where you can say, let's go back to the last known consistent state. Now, okay, given that that might be rare, but at least you can go back to the business and say, we, we've given ourselves those restore points um, at, at, at two sites, for example. So not only just in the U.S., everything that exists in, in the U.S. would then exist in the EU North, which is pretty cool. Um, but the other thing as well is when it comes to refreshing the dev, UAT, and non-production environments. So it's much more than just DR. It's also about saying, well, you know, if it takes me 16 hours to go and refresh uh, a landscape, right. well, can, what can ANF do for me there? Um, can it reduce the time? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, when I did this, and admittedly, it wasn't S it wasn't SAP I did this with. I, I did this with uh, with, with a, a different database. Let's just say it was that. But there, it, the premise is the same, and it used to take 26 hours when I did this when I first joined a bank before I worked uh, for, for Netta. Um, I left 
joining NetApp, knowing that I'd taken them from 26 hours of backup to 23 seconds. I had a similar experience. Oh, that... <laughs> or Oracle backup using this technology uh, typically took eight hours with Data Guard and and uh, R Man, and we took it to about fifty seven seconds. It, it, it's mad, isn't it? It's mad. And I just saw a, a great question that I run into. Sorry on the yeah, chat, which was uh, SMB and SIFS. Oh so, man, uh, that <laughs> you know what did it for me was in uh, the the Linux Linux kernel actually finally started defaulting to smb2 i believe it was and that was kind of the that was the death knell for sifs right once they yep. once they defaulted to smb2 in the linux uh the linux kernel distributions that was that was it done that's it so yeah all smb uh, all the time <laughs> smb all the time so sifs is what smb version one yeah one dot zero yeah yeah yep so we're now on three well, yeah, what is the state of that in... Uh, so I wanted to close... Well, let me, before we move on, I wanted to close out the SAP sort of conversation here in the way that look, we're, this isn't just an Azure conversation. Uh, we're very proud of receiving the the, HANA, the SAP HANA certification using Azure Net Files recently. That is a big, big, big milestone. Anybody that's ever been a part of any sort of SAP HANA certification understands what's involved with that. So kudos to, to yourself, Kirk, and everybody else on the greater Azure Net Files team, everybody on the uh, SAP and Azure teams that were involved, that is a big, big monumental milestone that's going to pay off for all of us uh, it going off in the fu going on in the future. But I wanted to shift gears a little bit because it isn't just all about Azure. We've we've got this for uh, Google Cloud, and if I'm not mistaken, I don't know that much about AWS. Full disclosure: I, I'm a I'm mostly an Azure guy, and I'm learning more and more about Google Cloud. But I'm wondering, at, at, at a certain point, this becomes a sort of ubiquitous solution for true multi-cloud, and that includes the hybrid nature of that being on-prem. So I like to talk in the bigger conversations about what hybrid multi-cloud really looks like. When you're doing things like you have an on-prem installation, you either need to migrate uh, that on-prem into the cloud, into a running instance that might be up there. You might want to be evacuating an entire data center, but you have that instance sitting there and you need a way to, a way to move it up that's going to give you the same level of performance and scalability. Or maybe you are just that big and you want to have more than one cloud provider and on-prem and you want it to all be in sync or basically geolocated uh, on a globe. All of this, all of this is available today. That's what I wanted that's to right. drive home. There's nothing stopping it anymore. You got the storage performance in the cloud that can handle it now. So, anything you want to add to that, Kurt? I think you've said it well, well there, to be honest. And yeah, there's not really much I can add other than you can get started immediately. Yeah. If you wanted to try it out, if you want to put a R word to the test, then it's there. It's there. You can spin it up. And if you don't like it, you've spent a few hours and, <laughs> and you're done. Uh, question from Brett in the chat. Will CVS for GCP and AWS become HANA certified in the very near future? I'm not 100% sure. I'm not sure. Uh, so so CVS for GCP just got certified, right? I believe it did, yes. Uh, but I'm, so, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, so I, I don't... Let's go check. I think Greg was yeah. saying it did in the chat, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah so uh, CVS for GCP is already there. HANA certified. So, uh, that's, nice. yeah, so that's two down. Yeah. AWS can One be tricky ago. sometimes, but we're working with them on it. <laughs> we're working with them. Yeah. Can we do it? Absolutely. So what else did you take away from Christian's keynote? I have, I wrote two things down. I wrote down uh, lots of sound effects, lots of talk about cars. An exorbitant <laughs> amount of conversation in a large opening keynote about cars and about moral imperatives and carbon footprints and robotic sound effects, but I missed, and, and you know, this is a thing that's going on all throughout this week. We intentionally targeted, we wanted to see Christian's first keynote as, as CEO after moving in up from COO, so I definitely wanted to focus in on that, but they are having multiple sessions all throughout this week, guys. We just couldn't, I can't cover all of them, unfortunately, but there were no announcements. There's literally no major announcements in the opening vision keynote of SAP Sapphire, that that astounds me. 
I'm 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 left a little bit going. Well, all right. Well, what did we just actually watch? And I, I'm curious to hear your take on what we actually just watched. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I was writing my notes and I was watching it thinking, I've missed something. Have I missed the? I, I've missed the announcement. I, I've only got a minute. That's I had one job. It was talk, talk to Nick about what the announcements right. were and how that would be a good thing. And I was thinking, how did I miss it? You, you guys uh, should uh, see my uh, notes for Microsoft Build from a few <laughs> weeks ago. There's pages and pages of notes. And even the AWS <laughs> Summit uh, a couple weeks before that, they're just notes after notes. after. I literally had, I, I wrote down lots of sound effects, lots of talk about cars. Oh, and you probably missed the most important one, right? Digital Twin. Oh, Digital okay. Twin. What, what is Digital Twin for those that, that weren't watching? Uh, uh, that's all I wrote, just Digital oh. Twin. I didn't write the context behind it. It was just, that, I, was, I was scrambling for things to talk about. I thought Digital Twin might be interesting. That could be good. What does Digital Twin mean to you? I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, all, all of the yeah. buzzwords were used. And even some new ones that I hadn't <laughs> heard before, like Digital Twin, uh, which might be coming yep. along soon. Look, I... I, I Let's let's wrap this up here really quickly. Uh, SAP had a bad morning. SAP had a really bad morning. They were able to pull it off. I'm glad a lot of you came over and were able to find the stream here. But yeah, this is one of those things that was a necessary evil, necessary for companies to learn. Look, there's a lot of companies that want to do everything on their own websites. And I understand why. More than anyone, I understand why. But there are platforms out there like YouTube, like Twitch, like uh, even Mixer if you wanted to. But YouTube and Twitch mostly that have figured out how to scale things to thousands and tens of thousands of users. And all it takes is a little freeware piece of software called OBS. And since everything's pre-recorded, you can push play on a video and hit start streaming and walk away and just let it work. And then you get to have fun conversations like we're having right here. So, I understand why SAP's having a bad morning. And I hate that they are the example child for all other companies that we're watching. Um, as, as people learn how to do virtual events and live in this new post-COVID kind of world where we're going to be doing everything virtually like that. Uh, I'm glad I was able to get it up and running. But uh, I, I have to say, I don't know what we saw. I was getting worried we wouldn't have a keynote to actually talk about. You were worried. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm o I'm over here just doing my best, kind of uh, entertaining, and you know, like the website's down. Sorry guys, but uh, I'll tell as many terrible jokes as I can. Maybe Kirk and I can just go ahead and get on. <laughs> but we got it. We got it. Found a found a Periscope stream <laughs> hidden under Twitter of it that they were pushing out. So lots of um, lots of other sessions, lots of other things happening throughout the week. Um, you've got Converge, you've got S Sapphire Now, you've got all kinds of different things over at events.sap.com as soon as you can get the website back up. Best of luck with that. I'm going to try and catch a couple of other things this afternoon. But, uh, Kirk, big thanks for coming and hanging out with me, man, uh, and giving this a shot. It's definitely something I, I want to try more of in the future. But uh, let's, uh, let's get out of here. Let's let everybody go. Thank you, everybody, for subscribing to the channel, too, as well. Uh, come join us in our Discord community. We've got over 200 core technologists where we talk about gaming, uh, any other ho uh, hobbies or enthusiasts. Plus, we talk about enterprise tech, and we're just sort of trying to re reignite the community, greater tech community, uh, in a new platform called Discord. So you can find, you can do uh, exclamation Discord in the chat. We'll get you a link to that. Uh, but for everybody joining us today, don't forget we are back tomorrow for Cisco Live. Keynote from Chuck Robbins, uh, CEO over there. And then Thursday, we're going to be doing the Veeam on virtual event uh, watch party. Same thing. Now, that's the day two event for Veeam, but we're doing it intentionally because they're doing 90 minutes of tech demos. And we'll also be having an after party for that one with special guest Rick Vanover, who's the Senior Director of Product Strategy over at Veeam. So for Kirk Ryan, my name is Nick Howell. Thank you guys very much for tuning in today. This has been a blast. I'm glad we were able to get it up and running. But take care, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you guys tomorrow for Cisco Live.